Hi everyone, in this video we are going to investigate the shape of the surface of a rotating liquid. So imagine that you have a cylindrical container filled with the liquid, um, as in the diagram on the screen, and you rotate the container about its axis of symmetry um, with an angular velocity of omega. So if you imagine that the liquid is made up of cylindrical shells, then what's going to happen is that the outermost shell in other words, the part of the liquid which is in contact with the walls of the spinning container, through frictional forces with the container, that outermost part of the liquid is going to start rotating as well. And then through the internal forces in the liquid, basically the viscosity of the liquid, that rotational motion is going to be passed um, gradually inwards towards the center of the liquid. And so it will take some time, um, but eventually it will reach some steady state where the entire liquid is rotating with the same angular velocity omega. The question is then, after the liquid has reached this steady state of rotation, what exactly is the shape of the surface of the liquid going to look like? Now we know it can't just be flat, it has to look something like what I've drawn in the diagram here, and you can understand that just by noting that from the perspective of an individual liquid molecule or particle, um, it's in a rotating frame, and so it's going to be feeling uh, some outwards fictitious centrifugal force and so the liquid tends to be pushed outwards towards the walls of the container. So to start making this a bit more quantitative I've just put down a Cartesian coordinate system whose origin is uh, at the central minimum of the surface of the liquid and remember that although I've just put two axes there this is really a three-dimensional problem um, however in the steady state it's going to be uh, rotationally symmetric about the y-axis and so we can imagine taking a slice through our cylindrical container and treat it as a 2D problem and the question just becomes find y as a function of x. So our method is essentially going to be to consider a particle of liquid sitting at the surface and consider the forces and the balance of those forces and uh, that's going to end up giving us y as a function of x. So if we just mark on the particle that we're considering and let's say it's at this arbitrary position there then there will of course be a downwards force uh, coming from the weight. So I'm going to label that as G times dm. And I've called it dm instead of just m because it's an infinitesimal element, right? It's just one particle. And so we're considering one infinitesimal part. So that's an infinitesimal weight. And we are going to have another force which is going to act normal to uh, the surface itself. So it's going to look something like this. Um, let's call that dn because again it's an infinitesimal force because it's an infinitesimal element of liquid that we're considering. Um, we should take care to justify where this dn force is coming from though and why exactly it's normal to the surface. It would be tempting to make an analogy with the normal contact force that you get when you have a solid sitting on top of another solid but we can't really use that kind of reasoning here because we don't have solids we have a liquid. So what you've got to remember is that the internal forces in a liquid are coming from the pressure gradient within that liquid because the pressure um, is not going to be the same at every single point in the liquid. Now remember that the entire surface is exposed to the atmosphere. That means the entire surface has to be at atmospheric pressure in equilibrium. Um, so it's an isobaric surface, pressure is constant all the way along the surface and therefore the gradient of the pressure has to be perpendicular to that surface because gradient points in the direction of fastest change of something and the pressure doesn't change um, as you move uh, along the surface. So that's how we can argue that the normal force is actually normal. Now we need some kind of angle that tells us what direction precisely dn is acting in. So I've just drawn a tangent line um, to the surface of the liquid and we're going to say that at that particular position the tangent makes an angle of theta with the horizontal that implies similarly that if we draw a vertical um, in the same direction as the weight, then our dn force is going to make that same angle theta um, with the vertical, essentially because there's a right angle between those two uh, dashed lines, the horizontal and the vertical, but there's also a right angle between the normal and the tangent, and so those two angles have to be the same. So now we're ready to come up with some equations, and we can do that by considering the vertical and horizontal components of the forces. Now vertically there can be no resultant force because um, it's performing a horizontal circle, it's not accelerating 
in the uh, the vertical direction. So you have a, a well an upwards component of the normal force, which is dn cos theta, just by resolving your dn, and that must balance with the weight, which is g dm. That gives us one equation. Um, let's call it equation one. Horizontally, the forces are not balanced. There's an unbalanced component of the normal force dn. That unbalanced component is dn sine theta. That must be equal to the centripetal force given by the general expression uh, mr omega squared, where r is the uh, radius of the circular motion. And here, your m is really dm, the infinitesimal mass element. The radius of circular motion, straight from the diagram, is x, just the x coordinate of that particular particle. And we are going at angular velocity omega, so we just put omega squared there. And we have a second equation. Now notice that conveniently, if we divide equation two by equation one, um, then the dm's will cancel and the dn's will also cancel. This is a good thing because these are both uh, quantities that we just introduced as part of our working. So we don't really want our final answer to depend on those. Um, so if we divide them, you get sine theta over cos theta, which is tan theta. The right-hand side will then just be um, x omega squared divided by g. Now, how's this going to help us to get y in terms of x? Well, to understand that, let's draw, in, draw a little zoomed-in version of our diagram at the particle. And all we have to draw is that point there. That's the, the particle that we're considering. And the tangent line, right, which is this one in the diagram uh, above and we said that there's this angle theta which is defined to be between the tangent and the horizontal so what you can do is turn that into a little right angle triangle say that uh, the horizontal part of the triangle has length dx because it's a small increment um, along the x-axis the vertical part is dy because it's a small increment along the y-axis and then from trigonometry, you get that tan theta is dy by dx. And that's very useful because we can then just write dy by dx uh, is x omega squared over g. This is a differential equation for y in terms of x. So we can just solve that and it's pretty easy to solve. We just integrate both sides. Integrate dy by dx, you get y. Integrate the right hand side where we've got our constant term, which is omega squared um, over g. You integrate x, you get x squared over 2. So I put a 2 there, and that's an x squared. We don't have to put a plus c because we placed the origin of the coordinate system uh, at the surface. And so when y is 0, uh, x is also 0, and therefore we don't have to add a constant. So the conclusion is that the surface is, well, it has a parabolic cross section. Um, so the surface itself would be a paraboloid. I also just wanted to point out that. Uh, assuming that it's an incompressible liquid and volume is conserved, um, the level that the liquid would be if it weren't spinning would have to be something like this on the diagram. In other words, between the minimum and the maximum of that parabolic curve. So that some of it, some of the liquid dips below, some of it um, goes above. And I haven't gone through the full calculation myself, but in principle, you could probably do a volume integral and use conservation of volume to figure out um, exactly where our parabolic surface is relative to the um, the at rest surface level. Also note that the dependence of our result on both omega and g kind of makes intuitive sense. If you make omega bigger, you spin it faster, then you're increasing the centrifugal force from the perspective of uh, an individual liquid particle. That would tend to push the particles further outwards and increase the curvature of your parabola which makes it was consistent with the maths because omega is on the top of the fraction. Uh, if we increase g, then gravity would have more of a dominant effect. It would be harder to get a curved surface in a bigger gravitational field. And that's again reflected in the fact that g is on the denominator of our expression. So it's consistent with our, our intuition. Finally, does this result have any useful applications? Well, in my last video, I talked about why um, paraboloids are a popular shape to make telescopes out of. Um, and so you could actually create a parabolic telescope um, either by spinning a container full of mercury, for example, liquid metal. Um, the disadvantage being, of course, that your telescope would have to point directly up. But you can actually do this. You can make liquid telescopes out of mercury. 
Um, or alternatively, you could um, get some kind of uh, substance which you heat up, you melt it, spin it around, um, create this parabolic surface, and then allow it to, to cool down and harden into that shape, and then coat the new surface with some kind of reflective material. So you could, uh, I don't know if that's actually done in practice, but in principle, you could do that to, to make a parabolic telescope. Anyway, that's all for this time. Thanks for watching and see you soon.